On this Wednesday night, we are ready to go. We've got a lot of things to talk about. A road game this weekend, a road game for two straight weekends, but a lot of things to go over. First of all, Coach Houston has joined us, and we will say, first of all, Coach, congratulations. You're still in first place in the Southern Conference. It's a two-way tie now, and you're 2-0, so way to go there. Well, it was uh, it was certainly a uh, very enjoyable weekend this past weekend in Johnson Haygood Stadium, and uh, you know, so pleased with the way our team played and uh, executed, and uh, just you know, made for a real uh, you know, just a, a a great day for all Bulldog fans. The other thing that I will uh, congratulate you on, and you've been congratulated a hundred times on this one already. It wasn't anything you made a big deal about, but the fact that your team can now lay claim to the fact that they can't talk about that stupid streak anymore. <laughs> yeah, you know, we didn't. Uh... We didn't, we didn't talk about it really uh, as a team until the night before the game, Friday night. We met, we met with the, the players in the, uh, at the hotel, and I just told them, I said, listen, guys, I said, you know, you heard all these you know, people talking about this streak and all that, and I said, like, you know, that streak will not help them one bit tomorrow between 2 and, and, and 4.30 or 5 o'clock or whatever time the game ends. You know, the only thing that's going to matter then is what we do on the field and what they do on the field. And so, you know, nothing else nothing else is going to factor in there. And, and the kids just really did a great job of going out and just being aggressive and, 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 you know, not worrying about outside stuff and just playing the kind of game they needed to play. Now, this uh, next piece, first of all, I want to say thanks to everybody who came out to watch the show tonight. We want to thank everybody who's watching on YouTube at the moment or watching a delayed broadcast of this on on YouTube, it's certainly being streamed there. One of the esteemed members of our audience said that's the best Citadel game he's seen played in 20 years. Well, what do you think about that? That's you know that's, that's putting us in pretty uh, pretty good company there. So uh, I don't know. I've only been around here for two years. So but uh, you go back 20 years, they had some pretty good uh, pretty good teams there, and uh, you know late 80s, early 90s, and uh, you know obviously that's the, our goal is to get the program back to. Uh, you know, playing at that level, and so uh, you know, I certainly think that that's probably the best, that, the best complete game that we've played since I've been here. Though on the other side of the break, we'll be taken here in a couple of minutes. We're going to go through the game that was played, the Wofford ball game, a little later on in the show. We're going to talk about the game that is upcoming for the Citadel Bulldogs at Samford on Saturday. They'll play another road game the week after that at Furman. But there are lots of things to talk about as we go along here. But again, we'll get very specific about the win over Wofford and kind of talk our way through what happened in that ball game. So a lot of different things are still to come with that regard. We have some questions from the audience that have to do with some uh, other things that happened with regard to the game the other day. So uh, lots to do still yet, and we're going to get into that in just a little bit. One thing that I want to mention right up here, uh, front here is that uh, we had gotten word a little while ago, you're going to do a little something different with your trip to Birmingham. Uh, the team's going to leave on Thursday, and then uh, Friday you'll finish that trip to Birmingham. Pretty uh, significant little drive up there. But uh, for lack of a better term, we'll call it you're going to tweet your way up to Birmingham. <laughs> and uh, at the handle, at Citadel Football, you can tweet your questions to Coach, and he will answer them on the trip. So Friday afternoon or so, uh, any questions that have come in via Twitter, the coach is going to answer those. So whatever you want to send a uh, question to. So anyway, that's one good way to occupy the rest of that trip. <laughs> well, let me start by saying this is Derek Satterfield's idea. Okay, I'm, <laughs> but not and, and Derek. For those of you who don't know him, Derek, Derek is he's got. His, I never can get his title right because it's so long. But he's associate AD in charge of all things communications, and, he, and Derek does a great job. And uh, and I really have enjoyed getting to know him this year. And he's he, I really think he's brought a lot to our football program and our athletic department. But uh, he's great with social media and great with ideas of connecting with our fan base. And, you know, this was his idea to, to, to try this thing. And I thought it was a, you know, a great idea and something we can take advantage of. So I'm looking forward to it. And hopefully we can get some, uh, some good interaction. Again, at Citadel Football, you can tweet your questions. And Coach is going to answer those on Friday afternoon when the Bulldogs are finishing up the drive to Birmingham. Pretty significant little trip. So uh, they're going to break it up. Do it in a couple of different uh, shifts there, if you will. And so that'll be uh, something to deal with when Friday comes around. So we've done some of the housekeeping. So when we come back, we'll talk about the big win over Wofford, the 39-12 win 
over Wofford. This is the Coach Mike Houston Radio Show from Fiery Ron's Home Team Barbecue in West Ashley on Sports Radio 1450. So I needed to deposit a check. I was about to head to the bank, but out of nowhere, it just started to rain. Like, really rain. I did not want to go out. But then I was like, duh, just use your phone. Mobile deposit techno thingy to the rescue. I'm Raina, and I bank human at TD Bank. Welcome back to Fiery Ron's Home Team Barbecue in West Ashley. This is the Coach Mike Houston Radio Show. My name is Mike Legg. Thanks so much for joining us. We're at nine minutes past the hour, and we're talking about Citadel football. And for now, specifically, we're going to walk through the Wofford win from this past Saturday, a uh, win for the Bulldogs, 39 to 12. And so we'll start this thing off, Coach, by going all the way back to the beginning. Uh, Citadel Bulldogs early in the first quarter of the ball game get uh, get a 39-yard field to work with, and you're able to get a one-yard touchdown run from Dominique Allen. Field position always plays a major factor, but in this particular case, you were in a situation where you only needed four plays and 39 yards, and you're on the board in this ball game. Well, and I thought you know the game like uh, like this. And uh, against a team like Wofford, uh, they're a ball control offense, uh, just like we are. Um, you're, a, co a couple things I thought were going to be big factors. We talked about last week. I thought turnovers would be uh, big in this ball game because of the limited possessions that both teams are going to get. And the other thing uh, that you know, if you have two pretty good defenses and two you know pretty good ball control offenses, is field position. Uh, and so we you know we really really worked uh, special teams wise trying to find a way to have an edge and. And, uh, you know, so we, I thought that Grant Drakeford, you know, really handled his role in that with the punt return unit great last week. Uh, you know, Wofford, uh, in, you know, used, employed two different punting styles, a straight on regular punt and a rugby punt. And so, uh, you know, we had basically two returners. Uh, and Grant was the guy to field the rugby kicks, which are challenging to field because they're kind of out of control. And so yeah. you run the risk of a turnover. So we've really been working to where we felt confident uh, in his judgment ability to handle those those kicks. And, and I thought it was a, a huge factor in the ball game. Not only with that uh, that first uh, that first you know return giving us good field position, but at one point he had a return that ended up with a net seven yard punt. Uh, but I thought that he was instrumental uh, and our defense and, and a couple of turnovers were instrumental to have us having great field position the entire first half. It's a perfect example of how you have something you see on the stat sheet that doesn't necessarily tell the entire story. It shows he had two returns for 15 yards. One of them was a 14-yard return. Right. And just to look at it that way doesn't necessarily describe the right. impact. But no, huh. how many yards do you think he saved? He probably saved 20 to 25 yards per punt. Yeah. Uh, because he fielded those kicks at around 20 yards, and, and with those are end-over-end kicks, 
and they'll hit and they'll just take off, you know, on, on the turf. And so, you know, they end up being a 40 or 45 yard punt that's not returnable, but it really only travels about 20 yards. So, you know, that 14 yard return is probably the one that ended up with the net seven yard punt. Yeah. You know, so it's a, a, a you know, that's that hidden yardage. Uh, that we talk about when we're talking about the special teams was a huge factor in the first half. So the uh, Citadel Bulldogs are in a position where they lead 7 to nothing at this point. Uh, the next uh, series that the Dogs get the ball back, uh, well, let's go back. Wofford has the football, a huge hit by Tevin Floyd. Yeah. Ball comes loose, Joe Crochet with a fumble recovery, and you've got the ball at the 24-yard line. Yeah, and I, I really attribute that to – you know, they Wofford ran the midline midline triple option out of the shotgun, which is very similar to our midline out of under you know our under center formation. Uh, Mitchell made a great play on the dive back, took him out of the picture. Tevin came right off his hip and blew up the quarterback right as he's trying to pitch the ball, forced a bad pitch, and Joe Crochet's right there to get on it and and give us a very short field that you know Dominique converted converted on the next play. But you know, I attribute that to not only the defensive kids playing their assignments to perfection, but also, having to defend our offense in the spring and in the preseason, you know, they're just very comfortable uh, in their roles and were able to play very, very fast. So, one yard touchdown or one uh, play drive, a touchdown, 24 yards. Dominique Allen all of a sudden has two TDs in the ball game, extra point, 14 nothing, and after one, that is your score <laughs> in the ball game. And so, uh, we were talking a little earlier. I've talked to a lot of fans during the course of the week since the ball game has occurred that talked about just how much hitting and how physical the ball yeah. game was. Pretty good example there uh, with Tevin Floyd's hit. There were other examples in the ball game, and there were uh, at times during the ball game. I thought, wow, if I were still playing, I guarantee the guys who played quarterback for Wofford had a tough morning on Sunday. They got hit hard. There's no well, question. You know, we, we felt like we, just, we had to have that kind of ball game. Uh, you know, our goal going in was to take the fullback away. I mean, Lorenzo Long is, uh, I think, the best offensive weapon they had. And so we really wanted to try to take him away at all costs. Uh, and then the next, you know, the next thing that we wanted to do was to really attack their quarterbacks and, and make them operate under duress. And so I think that we were very successful in both of those phases, which I think changed the football game. No question. They were hit and hit hard. After that, again, it's after one 14 nothing Bulldogs. Actually, the 24-yard touchdown run by Dominique Allen was the game-winning score because you won. Uh, they only scored 12. So yeah. uh, early in this game, as it turns well, out. I sure didn't feel know. comfortable at that point. I mean, I, I can promise you. Against a team like Wofford and – and and you, and you look at some of the some of the, the losses over the years to them. They always are a team that battles back and, and battles you for four quarters. And so, uh, you, you did did not feel comfortable at fourteen nothing. Right. You knew they were going to make a run back at us in the first quarter. A little statistical stuff. Dominique Allen was three for three for twenty seven yards and four rushes for twenty seven yards. Very balanced after one. And uh, I know you've said this week you thought he played uh, his best game so far. Yeah, and that's the, the best way to say that is I never felt uncomfortable with him the entire day. You know, uh, the Davidson game, for the most part, you felt comfortable during that game. But even there, you had some moments where you're like, you know, just relax, calm down, get under control, uh, you know, don't get ahead of yourself. Uh, and certainly in the other games this year, you, you felt like that at various times. But I, I felt like he was in complete control of himself uh, he was in complete control of the game plan and really operate our offense uh, as well as he has in his short career so far on to the second quarter we go Wofford punts it nets just 13 yards then the dogs have to punt then Wofford goes on a nine play drive 83 yards aided by a pass interference call and they score don't get the extra point and they go up 14-6 uh, and so there they come. They march right back. Right. And, you know, the, they get the touchdown, the, you know, the big play there. On the extra point, you have uh, D. Delaney and Tevin Floyd giving tremendous pressure off the right side of, uh, of the field goal unit or extra point unit of Wofford and forcing the kicker, uh, you know, into a pushing the kick wide right. Uh, you know, if he, if he had kicked it straight on, Tevin would have probably blocked it. Um, so, you know, something that you don't really see. Uh, but did affect the ball game because now it's put them in a situation where it's it's a uh, it's a two point conversion plus a score away. 
14-6 at that point, but you came right back, scored a touchdown. Right. Very next situation there. Uh, and on the next drive, you get 39 yards from Tyler Renew. You get 35 yards and a 17-yard touchdown from Reggie Williams. So there was some balance there between yeah. two guys who haven't been in the lineup as much as others. Right. And, you know, Tyler, we've talked about it just, you know, I've – He's been practicing pretty well for, for several weeks now, and I've been encouraging him to you know, keep doing things right and be ready when his number's called. Uh, and we felt like he had a great week last week, and his, some, some of his strengths really fit the game plan last week. Uh, and so we t decided to give him the start, and uh, to his credit, he was prepared, and he was ready, and he took full advantage of it and really played a great game. So I was very excited to see him, and he did a good job on the edge on some of the pitches and stuff. Uh, you know, getting some positive yardage there. And, and then Reggie is, a, is one that we've known is going to be a good player and just trying to bring him along, and, you know, being a young, a young back. But uh, he runs with such authority. He blocks with such authority. Uh, and it's great to have, uh, you know, that interjected into our offense. So this week, with regards to the B-backs, you've got a lot of ors on your depth chart. It's going to be Renew or McField or Smith. One of the three. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's great because you have three guys that really have different skill sets and, and different strengths and different weaknesses. And so uh, it's a luxury right now for us. Um, you know, having all three of those guys there in the backfield. And, and, and I, I, now I'm encouraging, you know, Evan and Isaiah just, you know, you know, keep working, keep pushing, keep challenging Tyler, you know, because if you can get all three of them competing and, and, and playing well together, it really gives us, uh, you know, a great weapon. That's very healthy, I think, no yep. question about that. So, again, the Bulldogs come right back, score a touchdown. They get a 17-yard TD from Reggie Williams. And 21-6 is your score, and that's where you go to the halftime break. Tell us again how you were kind of feeling at that point in the ball game. Good. <laughs> Certainly not comfortable. I mean, we, we come in at half, and I, I, I gather everybody up as soon as we come in, and, and it's kind of the cliche, you know, there's just nothing, nothing, there's no score. You, know, you hear it a million times. But I said, you know, listen, you can't worry about it. you just got to focus on the next play, and you got to continue to battle. And we, we talked about just playing – playing each play at being physical at the point of contact and just doing everything that we could on each play to be accountable to the other the other guys in the room you know whatever I can do to help my team win and I and I just you know try kind of try to keep them focused throughout the halftime so that they didn't let their minds get away because to be honest we've struggled coming out of the half the last few weeks and uh, I've been disappointed in that especially the Charleston Southern game and so I wanted to keep them kind of locked in at halftime, uh, focused on we've, we've got to come out strong in the second half. And, and we talked, uh, I talked to you know, Coach Thompson, we talked about the need. We've got to have a solid drive out of the locker room. You know, we can't go three and out. We've got to go out there and drive the football in our first possession. Uh, and that's exactly what we did and had one of the best drives we've had all year long coming out of the locker room. I would agree with that. No question about it. We're going to talk about that and more when we come back to Fiery Ron's Home Team Barbecue in just a moment. It's 19 past the hour. This is the Mike Houston Radio Show from uh, West Ashley's Home Team Barbecue on Sports Radio 1450. Style. Selection. Service. Quality. Value. See what everyone is talking about. Ashley Furniture Home Store.
722, welcome back to the Fiery Ron's Home Team Barbecue location in West Ashley. And this is the Coach Mike Easton Radio Show. My name is Mike Lay. Upcoming, it's the Samford Bulldogs on the road. More about that coming up in just a little bit from right now. We're at halftime of the ball game against Wofford. Kind of cherishing this thing. I got to admit, we're milking this a little bit. There's no doubt about it. But uh, we're uh, we're we're excited about how this thing turned out, and we want to kind of walk down memory lane with it just a little bit and uh, let folks realize what went down, and then get coaches' reaction to a lot of the different things that happened. On to the third quarter, we go. All runs in the next drive. A 16-play drive, mind you, and an 80-yard drive, and you took a ton of time off the clock, Coach. Six minutes and 42 seconds came off the clock in that uh, drive, and you said you talked about it at the halftime uh, about needing a drive like that, and you put one together and really kind of felt like it uh, you know, felt like you weren't going to let them touch the ball in the third quarter. Right. It was such a sustained drive. Well, and the thing – you know, the first half, we were up 21-6 at halftime, but time of possession was 20-10 to 10 in their favor. And the only concern there, and it's what I talked to Brent about at halftime, was you worried a little bit about if we didn't limit, uh, you know, their offensive snaps a little bit in the second half, I worried about our defense getting tired. I felt like if we stayed fresh, we were going to be okay, uh, you know, because we were playing really, really well. But, you know, if they, if they were able to wear us down, you know, I worried about them being able to make a you make a strong run back and run back at us. So I really wanted to take some time off the clock and really keep their defense on the field for a while there, uh, coming out of halftime. And you know, it's I, w- I wished every time I ask ask something of uh, of Coach Thompson he could deliver like that because that was as good as you possibly could do with yeah. a 16 play drive and to get in the end zone. You know, last year we talked about it uh, at the beginning of the season. We had a lot of long drives. We had a hard time converting those into touchdowns. End up with a lot of field goals on drives like that. So it's great to see a 16-play drive where we finish it off and get in get in the box. And it's difficult when you run, and you did every play, 16 runs. It's difficult for some teams not to lose the handle on the ball. But you didn't do that. Kept right. the, kept the handle on it the whole time, stuck it in the end zone and scored. And, kept, and you, no subs. I mean, we did not sub a single person on a 16-play okay. drive. Good so, to not know that. Uh, that says a lot about the conditioning of our offensive players, and, and that goes back to we've talked about it a lot. Our performance Saturday goes back to the way our kids practice, uh, you know, and it's a tempo practice, you know, where we're putting them under stress every single day. And, you know, we don't condition at the end of practice. We condition by the way we practice and because there's no better way to prepare to play than by going out there and doing it. So, uh, you know, I was really pleased with that 16-play drive, no subs, and be able to finish them off. You know, what an outstanding effort. At that point, with that score, Bulldogs are up 28-6. to Wofford gets the ball back, and that next drive, the one we're talking about now, was the one where the penalties came. And there were some yeah. questions that I wanted to go over where those were concerned. You had two unsportsmanlike penalties right. and a targeting call. Uh, first of all, we'll go in reverse order. Uh, and I know the answer to this, but for those who don't necessarily, after review, was Quinlan Washington's targeting call upheld or overturned? No, it, it was upheld, and it's a committee. It's a national committee that all the targeting uh, appeals go to. And, uh, you know, our director of officials and the Southern Conference, Jack Childress, felt like it was uh, a play that needed to be a- appealed, and so he sent it to the national committee. But they did uphold um, – you know, the, the targeting call. Uh, all that being said, and I said this at the press conference the other day, uh, the targeting rule is a good rule. Uh, it was put into place to take to take some of the cheap shots on uh, receivers, on defenseless players, especially ones directed at the head, to take those plays out of the game. Uh, and it's taken a lot of the dirty the dirty plays out of the game uh, because it's not just a 15-yard penalty. You know, it's a significant – it's yeah. a suspension. Uh, that being said, there is nothing about that play that resembles uh, what the intent of the rule was to take it out. You know, they ran trap option. Wofford did. We ran a hard edge stunt with Quinlan. So he's coming hard off the edge. Uh, the quarterback is – with trap option play, the quarterback turns his back. Uh, to the particular side that Quinlan was on. So the quarterback reverses out, and so as soon as he reverses out, Quinlan's right in his face. He has to operate pretty quickly to get the pitch off. 
Uh, you know, Quinlan makes contact with the quarterback while the ball's in his hand. And to the quarterback's credit, to Evan Jack's credit, he got the pitch off, but he got tackled. Uh, but it was flagged as a targeting call, uh, which uh, is very unfortunate for Quinlan. Uh, that being said, we'll, we'll handle it. We get him back at halftime this week, and I look forward to having a fresh Quinlan Washington in the third quarter. Would you agree that a lot of rules, and I'll use that targeting call as an example of that, are there more rules now set up to be, I guess, to take the judgment away from it where it makes the call almost black and white? It's like, okay, this occurred, this occurred, this occurred. We got to throw that flag. I don't think that I don't think the targeting call is a black and white call. I mean, it's a it is a judgment call. Okay. The tough thing with that call in the SoCon is we don't have instant replay. Yeah. Uh, now, would that have made a difference right like right there? I hope so. Um, at the end of the day, it's I think that it's something that and it's certainly something I'm going to push for uh, because I see that play a lot each week. Uh, that is not a dirty football play. That yeah. is not a play that. It does not need to be in the game. In fact, that's a play that I don't know how you keep it out of the game because it's a fundamental tackle. His head was on the right side. He wrapped up. He ran through the tackle. Uh, you know, it's a fundamental good football play. Uh, but, you know, you would like to see if that is something that's handcuffed uh, with the review panel, then I think that you need to maybe look at rewriting the rule uh, to where it correctly reflects what, you know, you want enforced. Okay. In that drive, as I mentioned before, you had a couple of unsportsmanlike penalties. Some, and I asked you this question in the press conference yesterday. I don't think I asked it very well, so I'm going to try it again. Yeah. Try to do a better job anyway of asking the question. And that is to say that some coaches tell me over the years that penalties are one thing. I can sometimes be okay with penalties as a result of aggression. Were those penalties the result of aggression? The two on that drive were not. Okay. You know the 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 call on Quinlan. I have no problem with that. Yeah, that flag because you know I don't want him to change one thing about the way he plays. Gotcha. Uh, you know the two previous ones on the drive were deals where the Wofford a Wofford player might have hit one of our kids in the back late, or he might have you know done something away from the play that maybe the officials didn't see that you know that antagonized our 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 our, our defender. And we retaliated, which you can't do because yeah. you're always the second guy's always going to get caught. Yeah. And we preached that to him, and it's a lack of discipline on those two players' parts, which you know we immediately took them out of the game, and they heard exactly what kind of lack of discipline that was from me and their position coach because you cannot have those penalties. Those kind of penalties will get you beat in a close ball game, yeah. and, we, and we've got some close ball games coming up, and so we've got to play with more self-discipline in those situations and not have that kind of call go against us. At this point in the ball game, after the Wofford scoring drive, it's 28-12 Bulldogs. Then, because Washington's not there, you get a kick return, 42-yard kick return for D. Delaney to get you uh, Not going. a bad backup, yeah, you know. Yeah. Go ahead and kick it to him. So, uh, yeah, and, I, and I'll tell you what, if uh, we had one player come off a block on the other side of the field and that guy's pursuit – uh, was the one that got D down, or he might have taken it the distance. So he was very close to breaking that for the, uh, you know, for seven. So on that drive, it would end up being a five-play, 58-yard drive as a result of that 42-yard kick return. You get a 24-yard touchdown pass from Dominique Allen to Brandon Eakins. That was a drive where I thought you had some some extremely <laughs> good mixing up of plays on right. the offensive side. Yeah, and I think, you know, we wanted to be aggressive throwing the football uh, going into this ball game. And that's – when I say that, that game it accurately reflects it. We were 7 of 10 for 125 and a score. Uh, to me, that's a good offensive day throwing the football for a triple option football team because sure. you mix that in with 300 yards rushing, and that's a pretty good day. But, uh, you know, a great throw by Dom, uh, you know, because he had to fit it between the corner and the safety and a really nice catch by Brandon. And excited for Brandon the way he's played the last two weeks. Uh, he started off maybe slow early in the season, uh, but uh, has been working very hard and has really been coming on here the last couple of weeks. 36-12 at that point. Then a 23-yard field goal is added later on to make it 39-12. Wofford has the ball. Game's waning moments. They throw a ball toward the goal line. It's intercepted. <laughs> and he runs it all the way back. 
We know, of course, <laughs> from where we're standing, we see the flags. We knew that there was a pretty decent chance it was going to come back. Right. But what a uh, what a way to put the punctuation on the end of it. He ran a long way for nothing there. He did. <laughs> you know, it was a fun play at the end of the game. Uh, I've told him, you better get your butt down on the ground because <laughs> – you know, you don't want to risk turning the ball over or anything like that on a play like that yeah. uh, when you've already got the game won. Uh, but, you know, the the thing that was enjoyable to me was, you know, last year with the way we lost the Wofford game and, you know, sitting over there thinking we'd won it and then having to sit and watch their, their whole bench empty onto the field yeah. in celebration. It was a lot of fun seeing our team rush the field and tackle Dondre down there in the end zone and just seeing the celebration and feeling the energy in the stadium, even though we had to find a way to clear the field to get the last yeah. snap off. But, you know, that was just a, a, a real kind of a punctuating moment uh, to end the day there for, uh, you know, for everybody. Dondre gets credit for the interception, but not the touchdown and not the return. And you did get one more play. You take a knee and you win the ball game 39-12. to So a pretty good outing for the Bulldogs. Again, you end the game at a 2-0 and tie with Chattanooga atop the league standings. Uh, the 16-game streak with Wofford is now a thing of the past. And so the Bulldogs improved to 3-2. and They'll take on another set of Bulldogs coming up on Saturday in Birmingham. We'll get into that a little bit and more with Coach when we come back in a moment from Fiery Ron's Home Team Barbecue. This is the Head Coach Mike Houston Radio Show on Sports Radio 1450. With Citadel head coach Mike Houston, Mike Legg, back at Fiery Ron's Home Team Barbecue in West Ashley. This is the Mike Houston Radio Show. We have recapped the Wofford win. The Bulldogs win that one 39-12. They move on to a team that is also 3-2 and 1-1 and one, uh, one and one in league play. Samford opened the season with a 45-16 home win over Central Arkansas. They flattened Florida A&M in week 2, 58-21. Opened Southern Conference play with a 31-21 home loss to then 10th-ranked Chattanooga. They're number six now. Lost at Louisville in week four, 45-3. Even their SoCon record at 1-1 one one Saturday with a 49-13 victory at VMI. They had 511 yards of total offense in that ball game. Picked off VMI quarterback Al Cobb four different times. Your impressions of Stanford's win over VMI, Coach? Well, I just, you know, first, just – Impression to Sanford, uh, they are an extremely talented football team at every position on both sides of the football and on special teams. And just, you know, they're big, 
They're strong. They're they can run. They execute well. You know, they are a very very good football team. So that being said, I thought uh, you know I thought VMI played them very well uh, in the first half and and really was in the ball game all the way through probably the middle of the third quarter. And uh, you know, you cannot give a team like uh, Samford you know four turnovers. And so when you know you start getting those extra possessions, uh, they just have too much big big play potential to uh, to keep out of the end zone. So that's when it, really when it got away from them. We will get back to Sanford in just a second. A couple of things that I hadn't mentioned uh, yet anyway. Tevin Floyd gets another honor, uh, and it's kind of strange. Uh, Tevin Floyd is the defensive player of the week in the league for the second time. He had 11 stops, two and a half tackles for loss. Uh, the offensive player of the week was Michael Eubank, who is the offense or the uh, quarterback for Sanford, who, right. who won it in week one when Tevin was defensive player of the right. week. So they've each had well, two, two honors there that have accompanied one another. Uh, but Tevin Floyd, we mentioned a little earlier, had that big hit that led to the uh, fumble recovery by Crochet that allowed the Bulldogs to start a drive at the 24-yard line, and they were able to score right after that. So Tevin Floyd, one of the big reasons why – the defense appears to be vastly improved this year. Yeah, and I'll, I'll tell you, just there's you – know, not that he, he deserved it in week one, but I'm telling you, he dominated that football game Saturday. I don't want to keep going back to that game because we've got to move on That's to Sanford. Okay. But okay. Uh, as good as his stat line is, that does not reflect just how well he played. I mean, he – he he took their running backs out of the ball game. Just you know, they tried to load him. He would just flat back them. I mean, he was a physical presence. He and James both were just a physical presence in the box uh, that they you know they just really couldn't couldn't account for. So just I was I'm really excited for him because I thought he deserved it, uh, and I thought that there was I was like you know if, if he ever anyone ever deserved an award this week he deserved that award and so really excited for him and congratulations for the way he's playing just what did you meaning you and the coaches do in the offseason to change the fortunes of your defense because everyone notices that it is a much better defense what did you do you know the big we each each year uh in the spring i i send our coaching staffs somewhere to visit you know, to go and just talk shop, you know, trade ideas. Uh, and I've been fortunate to have some very close friends, uh, you know, across the country in the college football, uh, you know, business. So, um, you know, offensively we went somewhere, defensively we went somewhere, and, and, and really we came back with a couple of good tweaks to our, our system. Uh, I think facing some of the teams like uh, Samford and Western Carolina and Chattanooga, we, I knew some things that we – that we needed to do, that I wanted to do, um, that we didn't do last year. That you know, as far as our package goes, uh, and so we took those things, and and that coupled with just the hard work of of our defensive coaches, our assistant coaches, that that they they put in a lot of time with our players, a lot of time developing our package, uh, and and getting it to where you know our players you know play without thinking. They feel very comfortable in our package. Of course, the system is their second year in the system overall, so they feel more comfortable with the system as a whole. Uh, and then the tweaks here and there and, uh, and the hard work of our assistant coaches has really paid off, uh, you know, with, without allowing our guys to play the way they're playing. Got a question from the audience that takes us back into the Sanford game just a little bit, asking okay. if you would mind explaining the penalty on Tyler Davis that had to do with the yeah. opposing player's helmet coming off. Uh, it, and, and walk through why that's a penalty on him and why um, why he's penalized for continuing to be aggressive on the play when right. the other young man just because he doesn't have he didn't stop playing either. Well, so. about about two years ago, about two years ago, the, the 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 rule came in that if a player loses their helmet, they must discontinue unless they're in the act of making a t tackle or in the act of blocking. They must discontinue competing at that point. Yeah. They cannot continue pursuing the ball. They can't. They can't do anything. It's got to stop. Uh, so during this play, uh, one of the defensive linemen from Wofford uh, on the interior, Tyler's playing center. One of the interior guys loses his helmet, and the play's going to the perimeter. And Tyler just turns and buries him. You know, I, whether Tyler noticed his helmet was off or not, I don't know. But I mean, he just turns and blocks the kid. Uh, and really, and really smacks him pretty good, and uh, so it was flagged. It should have been flagged. It's a great teaching p moment for Tyler. Uh, 
uh, and our, all of our all of our players. But uh, you know, certainly, I don't think you know anybody knows Tyler. I don't think there's anything intentional uh, there. But you know, it was a, it was the appropriate call. Gotcha, gotcha. Good answer there, because I did get the the question: Did the young man actually stop playing or discontinue the effort? He slowed down. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> he he he, w he was in the vicinity of the ball carrier though, so Tyler took him out. <laughs> So, uh, good stuff. That's a good answer on that deal. So, uh, okay, Sanford coming up. We talked a little bit about what they've done so far. They're 3-2. and two. This is what they do as far as their offense and defense goes. And uh, what they do is a spread offense. <laughs> now, before we get into specifics on personnel, they did have a head coaching change. Pat Sullivan retired. Yeah. And so in comes Chris Hatcher, who had been at one time the head coach at uh, Georgia Southern. He uh, then went on to be the head coach at Murray State right. uh, and spent five years there. Uh, new head coach, but very few new assistant coaches, including right. offensive and defensive coordinators. And I'm sure that was part of the deal uh, replacing Coach Sullivan, who, who stayed on at Sanford in another capacity, but of course is battling some health issues. But, uh, you know, they wanted to make sure they protected the staff because they got a very, very good coaching staff. So I think Chris came in. I think he brought one one coach with him, and the rest of the staff was the staff that was there at Sanford. So it allowed them to keep a good bit of continuity, but it's also the reason you don't see their schemes adjusted a whole lot from what they were last year. Now, Chris has a great resume and is a good football coach, and so he's brought some you know improvements that you can see uh, on film uh, and has done a great job because that's that's a tough deal to come in, you know, where you're inheriting somebody else's staff. Uh, I've, been, I've been around that where it didn't work out. And uh, obviously, it's working out for Chris. But, uh, you know, they run a spread offense uh, similar to what they did last year. I think they're playing much better than they did a year ago. I think they're playing harder. Uh, I think they look a lot more crisp. I think Michael Eubank has drastically improved throwing the ball uh, very well. His release is quicker and shorter. Uh, so I think that's probably, you know, Chris's touch there. But, uh, you know, just a very, very impressive offensive football team. Michael Eubank is in his second season at Sanford after transferring in from Arizona State. He is... Uh, 110 of 156 for 1,295 yards, 10 TDs, four interceptions. It's funny, I always put this particular sheet together for game day. I look at who the top passer is, top receiver, top rusher. They're the same as they were going into last year's right. game. So yeah. Same guys. Top target is Correll Hamilton, 30 catches for 339 yards and a touchdown. Denzel Williams, who incidentally does not start for them, is the top rusher, 56 carries, 303 yards, two touchdowns. An interesting statistical uh, anomaly, it almost seems like, 190 rushing plays, 190 passing plays right. for Sanford. That would tell you, wow, this is a balanced football team running and throwing. But as far as yardage goes, 66% comes from the pass and the other 34% comes from the run. Well, I think that kind of shows their big cl big play capability at the wide receiver position. In addition to Hamilton, they have two other receivers that could easily be a number one receiver on any team in our league. So they have three very talented wide outs. They have two very talented running backs. They have a tight end that's a great uh, receiving threat there also. Uh, but I think the yardage shows that, you know, when they're capable of the home run at any point in time in the passing game. And, uh, one thing that doesn't stick out in the stats that you see on film is of those 190 passes, there's probably 25% to maybe 30% that are screens. So very short, controlled passes that uh, are have a high completion percentage, almost like uh, an extended run play, you know, a toss play for us to the perimeter. Their, their, their perimeter play is the screen game. And so a lot of those uh, passing attempts are uh, high percentage you're going to complete it, you're going to get positive yardage, and you have the potential, if the defense fits it wrong, with those wide receivers they have to turn that into a huge play. 4-3 defense, top tacklers Justin Cooper. The SoCon's preseason defensive player of the year plays for Samford, and he leads them in tackles for loss and sacks. And he has a familiar last name. His name <laughs> yeah. is Michael Pierce. His brother, Miles, is a linebacker for you. Yeah, we've been trying to pry information on Miles all week. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Miles has had a good week of practice. I've been, I've been, I've been okay. on his rear end. I was 
<laughs> if we were going to play in Alabama every week, you know, you'd be a starter by now. So, I mean, he's had a great week of practice. But, you know, Miles is a young linebacker for us. He's going to be a good player for us. Uh, he's been coming along and, 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 and showing progress throughout the year. He has had his best week of practice so far this week. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing him play on Saturday. But his brother is a load now. He is uh, six foot, six foot one, six foot two, somewhere in there. But he is 340, 350 pounds. Very nimble. Uh, lines up at fullback on their goal line offense. Uh, plays interior defensive line for them. Uh, very athletic, uh, very powerful. Uh, you know, as a legitimate NFL prospect, uh, you know, you'll see him get a chance to play uh, after college. Uh, you know, I, I wish I wished he was lining up on this bulldog side, lining us <laughs> to the other one with his brother. But uh, uh, I did ask Miles which side his parents are going to sit on. I don't, I don't, I don't know if he's got an answer for that yet. <laughs> now, Michael Pierce, when asked about him, head coach Chris Thatcher said during the league teleconference on Tuesday that when and he, it, I found his choice of words interesting. When he wants to be, speaking of Michael. He is the most dominant defensive lineman he's ever coached yep. when he wants to be. So, it, you know, it, it, it sounds like he's got some room he wants him to move in and, and, and improve a little bit. But that's saying a lot. I mean, here, again, here's a yep. guy who's been at several <laughs> different schools and has coached right. a lot of guys. Yeah, and, I, I, you know, he had a great game against us last year. And, and he'll, he's going to give us fits on Saturday. I, I, I don't look forward to facing him, but uh, – you know, that being said, hopefully uh, our offensive line has improved drastically from a year ago. Just watching the game last year, uh, these past several days, we've watched it multiple times. Uh, it is astounding the improvement that our team has made from a year ago because that was maybe one of our better games we played last year against Sanford, and it is night and day difference the way we look now versus then. So I think we've improved also. So it's uh, it'll be an interesting matchup. Uh, you mentioned Cooper a while ago. He had a great game against us last year. Uh, uh, just a very talented linebacker and, uh, you know, does a great job running their defense. So it's, uh, you know, not only do they have a talented offense, they're very talented on the other side. We'll go to break, come back, and wrap up the show from here at Fiery Ron's Home Team Barbecue in West Ashley. This is the head coach Mike Houston Radio Show on Sports Radio 1450. There's more for you at Substation 2. Since 1975, Substation 2 has been serving slice-to-order, freshly made subs on our specialty New York-style bread, piled high with the finest meats and freshest produce. From the number 19 Super Special with seven mouth-watering meats and cheeses to an assortment of specialty sandwiches and salads, Substation 2 proudly supports the Citadel Bulldogs with two locations in Charleston and 43 locations throughout the Southeast. Segment of the show, the Coach Mike Houston Radio Show from Fiery Ron's Home Team Barbecue in West Ashley. Welcome back. And the Bulldogs go to the Sanford Bulldogs this weekend. It is a 3 o'clock ball game, 3 o'clock game on Saturday afternoon, meaning our pregame show will begin 
at 1 o'clock. I know in hour number one of the pregame show, Jay uh, Harper is going to have an opportunity to talk with Miles Pierce going into this one. Uh, an interesting topic that we'll be uh, working with there. Another reminder that uh, if you want to tweet questions to at Citadel Football, Coach is going to answer your questions Friday afternoon when the team is finishing up its trip to Birmingham. So a little uh, Twitter, if you will, a tweet up, if you will, at Citadel Football. Coach will answer your questions on Friday afternoon. So get those ready to go. The Samford Bulldogs and the Citadel Bulldogs coming up on Saturday afternoon. Uh, we talked a couple of weeks ago, perhaps, Coach, about the Wofford defeat a year ago you brought up at that point the Samford defeat so I'll ask you again though I was the Samford loss last year the hardest thing you had to get over for me it was and and the reason I say that is um you know at that point in the season we were playing much better uh we'd won a few games in a row uh it was senior day which for me is always a special day because I I, I put a lot of each year on the seniors of that squad yeah that's, that's how you remember your teams you know when you've been coaching for 21 years you know you have you know a lot of different teams and you remember the teams by their seniors and so I really put a lot of emphasis on those guys throughout the season and that's a day that we really try to do do some things to honor them and their parents uh, and really that's a day we play for those seniors and uh, against a team like Sanford uh, last year we'd played really we'd executed our game plan to perfection all day long we had them fourth and 15. We had the lead. There's less than a minute left. I mean, the game is over. Yeah. And we give up a big play to Hamilton. Uh, they score with about 15 seconds left and beat us. And so it was to have what could have been a great win just ripped away. It was it was crushing on that day. And uh, so uh, I think our team got over it quicker than I did. We played very well the next week at VMI. But uh, that's one that's kind of hung with me, you know, for a while. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, other questions. We had one from the audience asking about the uniforms for this week. Is dress white the way you'll go? I think it's summer leave this week. Summer so leave. We are, okay. we are white jersey and lead pant Okay. Uh, this week. And so uh, another one of the combinations. And so, uh, you know, our, 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 our cadets, uh, you know, when they, when they leave campus in summer leave, they have on a white shirt and their, okay. their, uh, their gray trousers. And so it's a, you know, very – very similar look white helmets white yeah. jerseys lead pants black uh, socks and shoes is yep. the photo that i'm seeing with regards to summer leave and so now that one's been taken care of uh another note on eubank he finds a lot of different guys 16 people have caught passes yeah seven have touchdown catches right so a big arsenal for him, it looks like. Yeah, I mean, it's like I said, Hamilton's a great player, but they have a lot of great players. You know, the, they have three uh, dynamic receivers, including a freshman, number, uh, number six, uh, who is who's going to be a difference maker and, and, and is a difference maker in the return game also. Okay. So it's, uh, it's not like you can sit there and just focus on one receiver. You've got to defend the entire field, which is what makes their spread offense so challenging because they're going to stretch you horizontally and vertically, uh, you know, with their number of weapons and their speed. Uh, six is Kelvin McKnight. They have a number nine who started every game, too. His name's Emmanuel Obajimi. Yep. Uh, one thing I note about them is that their starters have been pretty consistent through the five ball games. Yeah, and, uh, you know, this is a lot. And, and you know, uh, uh, the freshman is the only – guy that's not a veteran really in the lineup the other the other guys have you know were there last year we played them uh all their offensive linemen were on the roster most of them were starting last year for them so a lot of uh consistency there up front that's uh returning so it's a you know it's a group that's a veteran group as you might imagine they picked up two or three kids from uab yeah yeah and it's you know that's you know we've talked about it before that's that's one thing that uh you know is challenging to us is you know they, they they'll take four or five transfers every year from uh, FBS programs, uh, very talented players. Um, it's just not something that really fits us at the Citadel. So it's uh, you know we're taking the uh, the route of growing up our players, you know, recruiting well and growing them up. Which uh, you know we're excited about our young players, and I look forward to seeing them develop over the over the years. In all, Sanford has 14 FBS transfers. Ten of those 14 are on the depth chart. Uh, Bank, uh, Eubank is one of those guys. He transferred in from Arizona State. Uh, other games in the league this week. 
uh, Chattanooga at VMI. We'll walk through each of these games and uh, and and talk about what the expectations might yeah, be. Yeah, be, be interesting to see how VMI uh, responds. I think they are much improved. Alex Cobb is an outstanding talent, and he really, you know, watching the Sanford game last week, I know that they lost. I know he threw four picks, but boy, he can he can rifle the ball around. He's very talented. So it'll be interesting to see. It's a you know, it's a tough 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 road trip for Chattanooga. I'm interested to know just what these next two teams are all about because you've played them both. Yep. Western Carolina at Wofford. It that will be an interesting game. Knowing Mike Ayers and just the way he's wired and how competitive he is. I would be shocked if they don't play, you know, really well this Saturday, which will be a challenge for, for Western Carolina. But, of course, Western's coming off of a couple of a couple of big wins. So, you know, they're playing with a lot more confidence right now. So that should be a great game. Mike Ayers said after the ball game that uh, <coughs> your team defeated him, that we weren't ready to play. So, like you, I would expect he'll have I'll, them there. They'll be ready. Yeah. I promise you. Uh, ETSU going to be in the league full-time next yep. year. They're starting up football. They're at Mercer this weekend. Mercer plays everybody close. Yeah, I don't think I don't know if that's going to be a close one or not. Well, that one probably not. No, I think ETSU's <laughs> got their hands full there. Mercer's very talented, very talented. Like you, Furman has an open date this weekend, and I say like you, like you going into the Wofford game. Yeah, I wish they didn't. Yeah. That gives them two weeks to get ready for us, so that's uh, – but we'll worry about that next week. How much readier were you for Wofford after the extra week, even though there was some adversity to uh, There was, that but I'll, I'll tell you, you know, the thing is, even though we didn't get to practice as much as we wanted to that previous week, we started installing our game plan. Uh, we were able to get healthy. Uh, you know, it wasn't like we were in a rush. So we really got an extra practice, even though it was a challenge with the storms that past weekend. We got an extra practice that Monday that we typically don't get that much accomplished in the first day of the week because we had our entire game plan and scouting report completed. Again, congratulations on two things. You're 2-0 and in the league. Good to be sitting in first place. Yep. You've been in first place all year long after the win on September the 12th. Right. And waited a while to play that next ball game. So congrats to being, on, uh, being in first place. And congratulations on ending that streak. That's going to be something they're going to be talking to you about for a while. So good deal. Nice well, and that's uh, that's behind us. We got to get ready for Birmingham, Alabama. So I know uh, you know one other thing to touch, and we have several, several players from Alabama, and a lot of them from the South Alabama area. And so it's going to be a special game for them. A lot of a lot of fans and family going to be there, and uh, I know the Alabama guys are excited to go play. Thanks, Coach. Thanks a lot. Go Bulldogs. That's Head Coach Mike Houston. My name's Mike Legg. Thanks so much for joining us here from Fiery Ron's Home Team Barbecue in West Ashley. Our thanks to Barry Daniels back in the studio as well. We're on the air at 1 o'clock on Saturday with the pregame show, the kickoff at 3. Good night, folks.